working in this place I worship you I worship you Good morning church family we're so thankful to be together with you in the spirit of Jesus today worshiping him and looking to him for comfort Jesus has brought you here so pour out your heart and be filled with his peace and presence as we sing and as we pray. If you're able, would you stand with us? You are here, moving in our midst. I worship you. I worship you. You are here, working in the Maker. 
your light shines on in the darkness. And the darkness cannot and will not overcome it. Amen. In the darkness we were waiting without hope, without light. Till from heaven you came running, there was mercy in your eyes to fulfill the law and prophets. To a virgin came the word from a throne of endless glory to a cradle in the dirt. moved for good for the lamb had conquered death and the dead rose from their tombs and the angels stood in awe for the souls of all who'd come to the father are restored and the church shows christ was born there the spirit lit the flame now this gospel to the Lord shall not kneel, shall not faint, by his blood and in his name, in his freedom I am free, for the love of Jesus Christ, who has resurrected me. be seated. Let us be still and rest in God's word to us from the Gospel of Matthew. Now when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and sat down.
his disciples came to him and he began to teach them. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. This is the word of the Lord. Sisters and brothers, in this sacred space and time, let us name the ways our hearts are mourning and offer our burdens of sorrow to Jesus in prayer. Let us now ask Jesus to experience his compassionate presence in our morning that we may rest deeply in his comforting embrace. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Church, let's sing this together. The Lord is my shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. He goes before me. He goes before me. Defender behind me. Defender behind me. I won't fear. I won't fear. I'm filled with anointing. I'm filled with anointing. Cups overflowing, my cups overflowing. No weapon can harm me. No weapon can harm me. I won't fear. I won't fear. People of God, sing hallelujah. I am, I am not alone, for mm -hmm. He's my comfort. He's my comfort, and He always. Mm. Let's stand together, church, as we continue in worship this morning. Let's remind ourselves of the God who comes to walk with us. He is our good shepherd. Let's sing together. He always guides me. He always guides me. Mm, through mountains and valleys. Mountains and valleys. His joy is refreshing. His joy Restores my soul. Restores my soul. Mercy and goodness. Mercy and goodness. Oh, it gives me assurance. It gives me assurance that I'll see His glory. See his glory face to face. face.
in your spirit. Your spirit lives within me, so I will walk in your peace. Your spirit lives within me, my victory, my victory. Your spirit lives within me, so I will walk in your peace. Your spirit lives within me, my victory, my victory. Your shepherd we rest in your comforting embrace your love encourages us your spirit provides true companionship your tenderness and mercy fill our hearts Jesus, we yield to your invitation to make your joy complete. Coming together as one in mind and spirit and purpose. Sharing in your love that encourages us. Embrace true humility, lifting our heads to extend love to others, getting beyond ourselves and protecting our own interests, being sincere and securing our neighbor's interests first. May we adopt your mindset, living with your attitude in our hearts. Let the church pray. Jesus, King of Kings, may we walk in your light, loving our sisters and brothers, that your light might shine out through us in a dark and wounded world. Amen. There's a world at war, caught in suffering, 
silent casualties, oh God, grant us peace. In these sleepless nights, I can hardly breathe, despite brutality, I know that we'll be free, I know that we'll be free. Let the light keep it shining. Let it break into the darkness. All the love there's us to see. We'll all be free. In these desperate times, love will hold us here. Love will join our hands, teach us to have no fear. So we lay our head down to wash their feet. When they see our sister, oh, we'll all be free. Yes, we'll all be free. Yeah. So let the light keep it shining. Let it break into the darkness. All the love there's us to see. We'll all be free. Let the light and keep it shining. Let it break into the darkness. All the love tells us to see. We'll all be free. We'll be free. you pray with me? Father in heaven, Lord, you are God of all comfort, God of all truth, God of all wisdom. Lord, and we pray today that you humble our hearts to believe 
that this is true because you said it in your word and your word will not return void. Father, today I pray that you humble our hearts, that we might love our neighbors just as you have loved us, Father. And Lord, may we see your life as more than anything we can have and anything we can hold in this world. We thank you in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please be seated. Good morning. At this time, we want to continue our worship with a time of offering. If this is something you would like to participate in, I invite you to do that now. We have several different ways that you can safely give. You can text any dollar amount to the number below, or you can also give on our website, thecrossingchurch.com. If you're in person today, we have secure offering towers that you can drop an offering in when you exit the auditorium. If you're new this morning, I wanna welcome you and let you know that we're really glad that you're here. We have lots to offer beyond our Sunday morning services, and now's a great time to join one of these classes and groups. First, we have spring classes that are open to everyone, including Managing the Mess of Marriage, Financial Peace University, and our Discovery class. Also, a variety of Crossing Women's classes are available as well, but today is the last day to register, so make sure you check those out and sign up. There are a variety of both in-person and online options on various days and evenings throughout the week, including some with childcare provided. If you're in your 20s and you want to connect with others in the same stage of life, we invite you to attend a small group preview. At the event, you'll learn what small groups are all about and how you can be a part of a fun group that meets regularly to learn from the Bible together and in the process develop meaningful and long-lasting friendships. If you'd like to join a Crossing 20s group, attending the small group preview event is required, but they make it easy by providing dinner and childcare for the evening. If you'd like to read all of the details or register for any of these classes, you can text the word info to 65201 to receive the link now, or you can also visit the events page on our website. One last way I want to encourage you to get connected and fill a really important need is to volunteer in Crossing Kids. On your own, you might not always feel significant or that you're making a difference. But when you join the Crossing Kids team, you'll see how you make a big difference in the kids' lives and the life of this church. When you volunteer, you help kids develop lifelong relationships with Jesus, and you'll find yourself developing lasting relationships as well. To get started serving on the Crossing Kids team, you can text the word INFO to 65201 or also visit the events page on our website. With so many opportunities to get involved beyond Sunday morning services, I encourage you to take a step and connect in community and find encouragement from others within our church. And now, here's Shay. I want to welcome you. Uh, I'm glad you're worshiping with us wherever you're tuning in this morning, whether that's online or in person. You know, this past week in Washington, D.C., we watched as, thankfully, there was mostly a, a peaceful uh, transfer of power from one administration to another. And so I thought I would just take the whole sermon today just to talk about politics and continue the discussion. No, I'm just kidding. I think we've, we've all had enough, haven't we? Maybe to take a break. But you know, I do think that there's maybe uh, never been a better time to look at a passage in, in the Bible that talks about a transfer of power, not in Washington or maybe in Jefferson City, but in our own hearts as we learn about what it means to be a, a follower of Jesus, what, what it means to submit our lives to Jesus as our King, and, and to experience that healing in our lives and the healing that he brings about in the world. And, and so if you have your Bibles, turn with me, if you would, to Mark chapter 1. Mark chapter 1, we'll, we'll pick up there beginning in verse 14. Let's read it. After John was put in prison, okay, so this is talking about John the Baptist, the forerunner of Christ. I'll come back to him a little bit later in the sermon. But it says, Jesus went into Galilee proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God is near. Repent and believe the good news. So as Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, 
Jesus said, and I will make you fishers of men. And at once they left their nets and followed him. And when he had gone a little farther, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, in the boat with the hired men and followed him. You know, I, I, I think what we see here, in some sense, is just a, a small snapshot, a, a small glimpse from Jesus' life one day, where he's walking along the Sea of Galilee, and, and he calls some men to follow him, and they do. And he calls us to do that as well. See, Jesus' words here are for us. They're not just for, you know, those who we think of as disciples and the rest of us are Christians. They're not just for a, a, a few guys, you know, back then that kind of got to hang out with Jesus for a, a few years. No, they're for all of us. Actually, listen to what Jesus himself says later on in, in Mark chapter 8. It, it says this, Then he called the crowd to him along with his disciples, and said this, If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for a man to gain the whole world and yet forfeit his soul? What good is it for a person to gain everything that this world has to offer and to forfeit his own soul? See, what we learn here in this passage is that Jesus calls all of us to follow him as our king and to be his disciples. And so the question is, is what does that mean? Now, let me just be very honest this morning, not, not that I haven't been up until this point, but every one of us here is in one of two groups. Either you've turned from trusting in yourself, and, and you've put your hope, you've put your trust in Jesus, and, and you've begun this journey to live for Him, or you haven't. Maybe some of you are just coming, you're just checking out Jesus, you want to learn a little bit more about him, we're, we're glad that you're here. But wherever you're at, whatever group you fall into, I hope that this message helps you to better understand when Jesus says to someone, follow me. And so what I want to do is just give you four brief things that we see here in Mark's gospel about what it means to follow Christ, and hopefully at the end you'll see the goodness of following him. So here we go. Number one, Jesus calls us to follow him because of who he is. Because of who he is. You know, it, it seems a little bit strange to us, doesn't it, of just how quickly they follow him. I, I mean, if same guy came along in sandals up to us and, and said, hey, follow me, and, and following me is going to radically change your life, would you do that? And so why do they follow him? Well, in one sense, the explanation is very simple. Jesus is who he and the Bible claims him to be. He's God. He's the God of the universe. But it's not just that. See, what's interesting is, is that Mark doesn't give us the whole story here. You know, some people, when they tell a story, they, they like to give you every detail of what happened. Others of us are like, you know, just get to the point. That's Mark. But in the other Gospels, we read that these men had already spent time with Jesus. See, this wasn't their first meeting with them. They had already begun to see his power. Remember, Jesus walks along the Sea of Galilee. He comes up to them. They had just got done fishing. 
through the night. They've caught nothing. And Jesus looks at them and says, put your nets out into the water. And they say, you know, Jesus, you're a great preacher. You know what you're doing when it comes to preaching, but you know nothing about fishing. Everyone knows, right, that you don't fish during the middle of the day. And Jesus says, throw your nets out into the sea. And we have the miracle of the large catch of fish. See, they realized that he spoke truth. They realized that, that he had authority. They began to realize that this guy, he, he's like us, but he's not. In other words, as they spent time with him, they began to see his beauty. They began to see his glory. And when Peter realized that, remember right after the miraculous catch of fish, they pull the fish in, they're on the shore there, and Peter looks at Jesus, Jesus looks at Peter, and Peter says this to the Lord. He says, away from me, Lord. Away from me. You don't want to have anything to do with someone like me because I'm a sinner. You don't know what I've done. And Jesus says, I know. I know, Peter, and I want a relationship with you. And I want you to follow me. And, and it was the love and the kindness and the grace of Jesus that melted Peter's heart. And he followed him. Later on, the other disciples realized the same thing about their own hearts. They, they realized the same thing about their own sin. Remember, at, at the Last Supper, Jesus says to them, One of you is going to betray me. And what's interesting is that none of them pointed to Judas and, and going, I bet it's going to be Judas, right? None of them said that. N none of them said, you know, Judas, he's following you, Jesus, as a political leader. He thinks that you're going to lead some sort of political revolution where you're going to overthrow the government. But yet, Jesus, you keep talking about dying and then rising again and that whole, that, that whole thing. And so when, when, when Judas realizes that this isn't a political revolution, he's going to sell you out. They don't say that, do they? No, what do they say? They look at the Lord and they say, Lord, is it me? Is it I? Am I the one that's going to betray you? See, they knew their hearts well. Do you know your heart like that? That good and evil runs through the heart of every man and woman, as Solzhenitsyn said. Well, if you do, won't you see that that's why Jesus came? Jesus came to die on a cross to save sinners, and he wants a relationship with you. No matter what you've done in life, no matter what you feel shame about, Jesus forgives sinners. See, what we read here in Mark isn't a blind faith of just kind of following Jesus without evidence. No, they were looking at the evidence. And so when Jesus says, follow me, they do. Listen, here's my point. I kind of have several points within my first point. I, I get it, but, but I want you to catch this. The call to follow Jesus doesn't just come out of nowhere. 
It doesn't just come out of nowhere. We get introduced to him. Maybe someone talks to you about him and the difference that he's made in their lives. Maybe someone invites you to church. Maybe you get involved in a Bible study and you start learning about his life. Maybe you're in high school or or college and, and you've been raised in a Christian home. And in some sense, you know that it's really been your parents' faith. Whatever situation you're in, there comes a point When you begin to understand that this Jesus is who he says he is, and he's calling you to follow him. He's calling you to follow him. That's the first thing that I want you to see here. But the second thing, the second thing that Mark shows us is that following Jesus means investing our lives in something that is bigger than our lives. Following Jesus means investing our lives in something bigger than our lives. Look with me at verse 17. He, Jesus said to them, follow me and I will make you become fishers of men. See, Jesus says, I've I've come preaching the good news uh, about the kingdom of God, and you enter into it by repenting and and believing in me. And he says, likewise, you're going to get the privilege of pointing other people to me. See, he calls all of us to be a part of that. He calls all of us to be a part of influencing others for Christ. To be a part of a process of God drawing people into a relationship with himself and finding life. And so let me ask you, are you thinking that way about your life? That that he's making you into fishers of men and women. That that he wants to use you and and me and our spheres of influence with the people that he sovereignly brought into our lives. With our co-workers. With our friends. Even with our own kids. Right? This is very convicting for me to say this, but I mean, as they look at your life... What do they see as the most important thing in your life? Is it Jesus? Or is it maybe other things that have kind of pushed him out? You know, you can't fool your kids. No matter how hard you try, they always notice. But you know, when I think that it comes to this whole idea of being fishers of men... We sometimes think it's either this right here, okay, right? It's wearing Christian t-shirts, and, and I'm not going to knock this at all, okay? Because I know that probably after the service, someone is going to come up to me and say, I came to Christ because I saw that guy wearing that t-shirt right there. But some of us think of evangelism, we, we think it's, it's just this right here, or maybe Unfortunately, some of us think that it's this. Too many of us maybe think that it's, that it's this right here. And as my good friend Scott Saul says, he's never met someone who was scolded into the kingdom of God. See, maybe the most important way we influence others is not by what we say, but how we say it, speaking truth with grace, and by what we wear. And by that, I mean, do we, as Paul says in Colossians, clothe ourselves with love and compassion and kindness and humility and good works and mercy towards those who don't know Christ? Jesus, remember when he looked at the crowds, he always rebuked the religious leaders, but when he looked at the crowds, he always had compassion on them because he saw that they were following after other gods that would never satisfy. He had mercy. He had compassion on people. He didn't just see people as just some enemy to be defeated. 
in some sort of political or cultural war. See, we're to speak and to live in such a way that others are attracted to Jesus. Jesus says that as we follow him, he will make us into fishers of men. But the third thing that we see here is that following Jesus means finding our identity and valuing him more than anything else in our lives. Notice that Jesus goes to Simon and Andrew and he says, follow me. And it says that they left their fishing nets and followed him. In other words, their jobs. And then he goes to James and John and they left behind their family. They left behind their father Zebedee to follow him. And I think that what Mark here is showing us is that following Jesus is to take precedence over everything. Our jobs, our families, our possessions, even our own lives. In other words, he wants to be first. He wants us to find our identities in him and not in these other things that are so fleeting, right? See, sometimes when we read this passage, I remember as a young Christian thinking, as I read this, well, then this, does this mean as a disciple of Christ that he's calling all of us to leave our jobs and our family and, and, and go to the mission field? Is that what the call of Jesus is in our lives? Well, I don't think so. Because we know That from reading the rest of the Gospels, these men did go back and fish again. They did go back to their jobs. And we also know that they did go back and have relationships with their family. In fact, right after this, if you continue to read in Mark, Simon and Andrew, they go to Capernaum. They go to Peter, or Simon's mother-in-law, and they take Jesus with them. They go to there to care for her because she was sick. In other words, becoming a follower of Jesus, following Jesus helps you to even be a better son-in-law to your mother-in-law. Following Jesus helps you to be a better parent. Following Jesus helps you to be a, a, a better child. Helps you to be a better citizen within society. See, Jesus says, loving me, finding your identity in me must become the number one priority in our lives. Everything else comes second. Everything else gets behind that. See, when Jesus says, follow me, and we say this, I'll follow you as long as you bless me. Or I'll follow you as long as you give me good health. But as soon as my health goes, and I I don't know, Jesus, I'm not so sure. I'll follow you as long as my career is successful. As long as my career turns out the way I think it should. I'll follow you as long as you give me that perfect little family. I'll follow you as long as the culture thinks highly of me. I'll follow you as long as the culture thinks highly of me. Well, whatever you fill in the blank with, can I just humbly suggest to you that in some sense, that's your real God. That's at the end of the day what you're really looking to to give you meaning and your identity. And I think Jesus is saying to us, I won't won't be a means to an end. Folks, listen. There is a cost to following Christ. I can't sugarcoat it for you. There is a cost to following Christ. 
Sometimes in the eyes of this world, right? Some of you with your families, you come to Christ and they reject you. Some of you in, in your workplaces to become a Christian or to let them know that you're a Christian, they look down upon you. They think you're not very smart. They think somehow that you have some sort of blind faith. But we have to remember, right, John the Baptist is in prison as Jesus is speaking these words, right? Herod had thrown John the Baptist in prison, and, 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 and John had spoken truth to power. John had called Herod out, you see, for sleeping with his brother's wife, saying, hey, Herod, that's not good. That doesn't lead to peace. And he ended up losing his life as a result. There is a cost to following Jesus. But if you think about it, there's a cost to following anything in life, right? You know, a, a few years ago, I can't help but think about uh, that little girl, Emma Burton, five years old, living in the state of Kansas. And at school one day, they had to celebrate the state of Kansas Day at school. Probably a short exercise, I would think. But uh, No, I'm just kidding. But, uh, but anyway, she, they, they placed a, a, a Jayhawk in front of her, and she was supposed to color the Jayhawk. And instead, she refused because she didn't like the Jayhawks, and so she took that and she threw it right there in the trash can. God bless that little girl. I just <laughs> <laughs> brings a tear to my eye. But what I want you to see is that her loyalty in some sense, cost her. Now, I'm not advocating that. You know, you need to mind your teachers. But, but what I want you to see is that there is a cost to following Jesus and aligning our lives with him. You know, we stand up here and we preach out of the Bible and we preach sermons. Sometimes we get to preach sermons about that God is love, right? Right? Now, he's more than that, but when we preach sermons about God as love, everybody's just like, yeah, thumbs up right there with you, Pastor. <laughs> or we get a chance to, to preach from the Bible and talk about God's heart for the world and, and, and God's heart for biblical justice and, and, and for mission and, 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 and for those who are poor, and, and everybody out there is like, right with you, Pastor. Preach it. But there's other times you, you, you see that, that we have to preach harder passages. We have to talk about what the Bible says about sex right before marriage. That sex is supposed to be in the context of a marriage. It's like a fire pit, right? Works well there in the context of marriage. But take the fire outside of the fire pit and it causes all kinds of problems in life. And we preach that, people are like, we had to preach what Jesus said, right, about hell and, and judgment. He, he talked about that more than sex, more than almost anything, maybe except, except money. We have to preach passages where Jesus said, John 14, 6, I am the way and, and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. And we think, well, that sounds so exclusive. But in reality, it's inclusive. It is inclusive because it holds out hope to everyone. It holds out hope to sinners. But sometimes when we hear passages like that, we think, you know, I, I don't know, Jesus. I don't know if you've thought this one through. I don't know if you're quite as smart as we are on these, on these issues but he's God. He's God. And what I want you to see is that you can't pick and choose what you want to believe in following him. Following Jesus means aligning our lives with him, and there is a cost. But what I want you to see this morning is, is that the gain, the gain both in this lifetime and especially in the next, will make whatever it costs you to follow Jesus in this life seem like nothing. It will seem like nothing. Because this, 
This life, it's just a dot, right? It's just a dot. And the line of eternity goes on forever. And when we're following Jesus, that's where he's taking us. All the way into eternity. That leads me to the final thing I want you to see here. And that is, is that following Jesus means following him into a deep and an everlasting joy. Following him into a deep and an everlasting joy. See, sometimes when we think of following Jesus, we think kind of too exclusively of the cost. You know, we like to quote Dietrich Bonhoeffer's book, The Cost of Discipleship. And, and sometimes we like to think about what we have to give up to obey him. Like somehow Jesus is going to make our lives miserable. But that's not it. That's not the point. The main message of Jesus is not death. It's life. It's life. When Christ bids a man or a woman and calls them to come and follow him, he calls them to come and to live. Jesus said, I came that they might have life and have it abundantly. See, there is a joy. There is an unspeakable joy that comes into our lives when we follow Christ. By God's grace, I want to believe that more and more. By God's grace, I want you to believe that as a church. Following Christ is worth it. And so the question this morning is very simple. Are you following him? Are you aligning your life with him? Are you obeying him? If not, won't you let the love of Jesus, won't you let the kindness of Jesus dying on a cross for you and your sins melt your heart and see his kindness, see his goodness, and see that following the resurrected Christ is worth it. Would you pray with me? Father, I pray that you would open our eyes in a fresh way this morning to see the beauty of Jesus, to see the glory of Jesus. Help us to see that following him, being obedient to him, is worth it. Lord, help us to see that. Help us to count everything in this world a loss compared to knowing Christ. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Before we go, one final point that I didn't get a chance to get to in my sermon. But one of the other things I want you to see is that when we follow Jesus, we follow him as part of a community, right? Remember, Jesus calls James and John, and it's Peter and Andrew, and it's the disciples. And sometimes we think, you know, following Jesus, I'm the only one, right? No one else is, is following. But no, he calls us to follow him as part of a community because that's where we learn and that's where we grow. And so I just want to mention one quick thing. Ladies, you saw earlier in the announcements, lots of things going on for you. But I do want to mention for the guys out there that beginning this week, uh, beginning actually tomorrow night or Friday morning, I'm going to be leading a Bible study seven weeks through the book of Revelation. And you're thinking, what? Revelation? Uh, it's going to be a 50,000-foot view, and hopefully I'm going to be able to help you to see and understand that book and see and understand how that book is so applicable to our lives today and will help us in following Jesus. And so if you're interested in that, please sign up online under featured events. 
Would you stand with me to receive God's blessing? Now may the love of God and the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Thank you for worshiping with us today.